This is the window of the royal appearance. Kings who looked down on the population from their windows of appearances ruled a mighty empire. It went through Palestine onto Syria and Iraq and beyond. They spent most of their time in the empire fighting. Egypt was ruled from a series of administrative complexes. The whole country became more cosmopolitan. This building, for example, is a copy of a sort of a Syrian castle right in the heart of Egypt. For the ordinary people who lived outside the walls of these imperial complexes, the insides must have seemed very mysterious, the nucleus of the great empire. The glory of that empire is all here on these great brown walls, images that for us spell out power and majesty. But the scenes on the walls are endlessly repetitive and highly ambiguous. It seems that Egypt was a truly great power, but after all, history is only myth, stories trying to make sense of reality. Between these huge enclosure walls made of mud brick and the stone temple were the offices of the administration of Egypt. There were the viziers, the people who controlled Upper and Lower Egypt. The scribes, the offices of the tax collectors, the granaries, the food stores, an ilometer to judge the value of the crop that year. The royal stables, all were packed into this area. Right in the middle of these administrative complexes, and always the largest element, is a great temple made of stone. This temple was dedicated to Ramesses III, and Ammon Ray together, the king of men and the king of the gods. Only the king or the priests were allowed to perform the complex rituals that took place in the hidden sanctuary at the back of the temple. In the front part of the temple, Ramesses recorded all his great deeds, and boy was he a fighter. After all the great conquests throughout Asia, Egypt suddenly found itself in a position of having to protect its borders. There were great waves of invaders coming down from the Mediterranean. They brought their wives and their kids with them. They meant to stay. For 20 years, Ramesses fought them off. He fought them on the sea and he fought them on the land. And his battles almost ensured that Egypt survived free of foreign influence for nigh on a thousand years. Empires might last for a thousand years, but even the mighty pharaohs were mortal. And when they died, they were laid to rest in chambers at the ends of great corridors carved into the mountains of Thebes. The real substance of ancient Egypt was made up of endless generations of people living normal family lives. And it was groups of these more humble folk who decorated the great temples and made these magnificent royal tombs here in the Valley of the Kings. There were 24 more royal tombs made here in the Valley of the Kings. Over a 500 year period, a very special gang of craftsmen and artists made them. They lived in a village just over the mountain. Deir el Medina is the modern name of the ancient place. From around 1500 years before Christ, the ancient craftsmen walked these same paths between home and their work, back there in the Valley of the Kings. The Deir Medina people were the real experts in all the rituals and paraphernalia that surrounded death in ancient Egypt. Not only did they make their own tombs, the royal tombs, they also did a roaring trade for other people at Thebes. 
all those things that people wanted, the sarcophagi, the coffins, all those grave goods. Their own cemetery was just above their little town, but quite close to it, so the dead were sort of mingled with the living. There's some evidence, which is quite rare in ancient Egypt, there was actually an ancestor cult going here. Well, in its heyday, this little cemetery would have been beautifully kept with trees and plants and flowers. And on special holidays, the people would have come up here to sit by the chapels of their dead. And all the while, their ancestors were buried in shafts like this underneath them. This is the climax of the road to the tomb. Two fine staircases, a great central ramp up which the sarcophagus was dragged. Top of the ramp was a funeral chapel. A lot of them, like this one, little pyramids. Inside these chapels were small rooms, usually full of paintings. They were places where the family could leave food for the spirits of the dead. When the procession got up here, they would knock down the sarcophagus, take out the coffin, bring it over to the chapel, stand it in front of the door here. Then the ritual could start. Now these rituals were very important because the dead man after all had died and he needed to be reanimated again for his life in the next world. There were a very elaborate number of sort of rituals that took place in front of the tomb. And the climax of this was when the priest who was officiating got out this very strange old fashioned ax, which was sort of shaped like that, and had a little flint in the end. And with this ax, he tapped the lips the mummy case and that reanimated the man his mummy and everything else that he was taking into the tomb with him there was nothing much left to do then to bury the man in his shaft so they reached for the coffin but as they took it the women would come out and grab hold of it and scream and shout in genuine expression of grief because in the end the ancient egyptians didn't like the idea of dying any more than anybody else party got the coffin down the shaft they brought it through these crypts where there were earlier burials from the same family <laughs> you see what I mean is the people who painted these tombs painted them for themselves. They were doing their own thing, what they wanted in their tomb. But with one big difference, they were the best decorative funerary painters in Egypt. And these guys were the people who painted the tombs of the kings. And they worked with their hands and their eyes every day of the week. And when they got time off for their own monument, this is what they did. So it's a very special art you're looking at. Buy the best for themselves. And these guys just didn't paint the pictures didn't run down the paint shop for a palette and a tube of white, like painters do today. They got everything out of the landscape. All the colours here, they've made their own bricks, they've made their own walls. What they've done is taken a little bit of Thebes, twisted it round and made this wonderful, beautiful room with the skill of their own hands. around the head end of his sarcophagus, 
Sanejim chose some of the more difficult to understand, perhaps, religious scenes. They're complicated because, by their very essence, it's the mystery which is the complication. So when you see Mr. and Mrs. Sanejim worshipping at a shrine, and you can say very learnedly that this God is so-and-so and this God is so-and-so, it's not really that important. Where it's really at, in fact, is saying, this is Sanejim worshipping the gods. He is standing before his God. And it's as silly for me to try and explain that as it is for me to try and explain the Holy Trinity to you. But there is one thing here which is quite under gas. And this is a scene which shows Sinedrim laying on his bier and the god Anubis, who looked after the dead, is actually just putting the finishing touches to his funeral mask. In museums, you often find these Anubis masks that fitted on the heads. So the people who actually tended to the mummies before they went into the tombs actually dressed up as the gods and played a part. This is the wall that was at the foot end of Sinejim's coffin. So perhaps as he laid there for all eternity, you could sort of tilt up and look at it sometimes. And on it, he and his friends painted their view of heaven. It's a lovely heaven, really. You can see it's agricultural fields with water, bands of water running all around. Perhaps it was rather apt for a man who lived in the desert and worked in the Valley of the Kings to pitch such a wet and watery heaven for himself. The ancient people have told us a lot about their ideal afterlife, but what do we know about their everyday life? At Dale Medina, archaeologists have recovered amazingly detailed accounts of these craftsmen's households, and this is due to a most rare what? skill possessed by this community. What? Most families had somebody in it who could write, and boy, did they write. When the French dug this up 50 years ago, they found thousands of documents, bits of pot, stones, all sorts of things, scribble, 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 all over the place. And writing, you know, makes people different. It makes them perhaps more self-assured, a bit more pompous perhaps. It makes them more moralistic, it makes them thinkers. This is the high street of Daryl Medina, where the servants in the place of truth, the people who made the royal tombs, all lived, packed together side by side, like they still do in modern villages in the Middle East. They were sort of bourgeois, an artist community, largely literate. And boy, did they get up to some things. In the town itself, well, everything went on. Everybody was having lawsuits. I suppose they do in villages rather a lot. Every now and again, there was a murder, adultery. It all happened here. Like little letters from a guy who said he couldn't possibly work today because he had to take the foreman's donkey off to be watered so he couldn't come to the tomb. Or a very polite letter from the authorities saying, uh, where are those 50 copper chisels we lent you to uh, bash out the reliefs on the west wall? receipts for flogging coffins or swapping them for piles of carrots and lettuces, official documents from the chief ministers asking where certain supplies which have mysteriously got lost, where they've gone to. And there's a very moving letter from a man to his dead wife asking why she's making him so miserable still. Well, here I am back in the high street. And I bet you 3,000 years ago you'd have seen the lace curtains move as I walked down here. It seems that here there was really no fixed price for things. I mean, some people in their spare time used to knock off coffins and little statues and things. Other people had spare groceries. And these things were always sold and bartered amongst each other, but never for fixed prices. There was never sort of 10 carrots or a coffin or something. It was what you needed that day and what you had spare that day. 
Now that can, it sounds extraordinary, I know, and it can really only work if your society is caring, and the most important thing of all, if nobody wants to be a millionaire. In the East there is a lack of envy, and that after all is what fuels the West. But here, we have a society where caring and thoughtfulness, a sort of a ideal socialism, actually spread and worked right throughout the community. Nice to imagine this place bustling with life, and it's a rare chance, because simple buildings made of mud brick don't usually attract the attentions of Egyptologists. And that's a pity, because here you can walk down the high street, see the shapes of houses, pry into the everyday life of ordinary folk, so, every one of the residences in this desirable estate had the same sort of features. Fine front door, fitted stone sill, splendid shrine room with fitted gods, and beyond, the family room, with a fine fitted bench for eating and sleeping, and in the centre, of course, as in all the Daryl Medina houses, a fine palm column. And it was around this column that all the family life revolved. Ancient Egyptian family life was not the huge extended families that we're used to seeing in African society today. It was really dad, mum and the kids, and perhaps an aged relative or two. Well, I'm just going to pop into next doors for a minute. See, here I come, out the front door, into the high street. It's very narrow, isn't it? it must have knocked people flying if they'd just come out of the houses, somebody had run past. Next doors, it seems, was a bit posher. Nice white sill, beautifully polished by the housewife. Go into the front room, lovely, two coats of white paint, a nice dado all round. But joking apart, what you always find in these front rooms is the shrine in the corner, because these people, as they lived and breathed, were religious. Officially, they worshipped the god Amenhotep I, the king who probably started the village. But unofficially, like most Egyptians of their class and type, they worshipped all those little household gods, the sort of second grade of gods, which were so popular and gave such immediate protection to the people. So, this is your nice little Hampstead bourgeois colour supplement kitchen about 3,000 years ago. You can see they were really into the natural look here. It's uh, actually handfuls of mud lovingly sprinkled over the rough stone walls where the facilities really aren't so hot. These, as you can see, are probably meant for pounding up wheat in with great thumping things, sort of like a primitive Kenwood or something. And these are mainly used for bread, actually. They were really big on bread. There are about 40 or 50 different sorts, and they mixed everything with it. Milk, fat, all sorts of things. These little spice grinders for those extra added flavours, these were the sort of things you grind up a little bit of date in, which was actually the main sort of sweetener they used in those days. And of course, the most precious commodity of all, the water, be carefully brought in and stored here individually in jars, something like these ones. But that actually was probably one of the most scarce commodities of the area, delivered to the valley every day. These cool, dark cellars run off all the kitchens of Daryl Medina. Very necessary when you're not growing anything near the village. But everything is brought up from the royal storerooms. All the food then was deposited down there. Hopefully, except things like fresh fish, you know. But all the oil and vegetables, all that sort of stuff was left down there. And in the more affluent cellars, of course, there'd have been some wine. Egyptians were as big a wine snobs as we are today, really. They had favourite areas from where the grapes came, they had their vintners, they had everything. In fact, as far as food and drink went, the ancient Egyptians did as well as we do. These stairs led up to the roof. It was probably in the summer. That's where all the family went to sleep. This valley, this little valley, must be a real sun trap in the summer. I know our house in the next valley along goes up to 140, 150 degrees. And actually, Mud brick is one of the better insulators. So, in the winter when it was cold, the house would have heated up in the sun a bit during the day, 
that have come back into here and the warmth into rooms like these for a really good night's sleep. You know, one of the really interesting, perhaps appalling things about these houses is how alike they all are in this village. Exactly like one of those trendy middle-class estates that are popping up all over England. There was just this one gateway to the village, which, like the great towns of medieval Europe, was shut tight at night. It was guarded, and people were checked in and out, from the police post here, which was staffed by Nubians, brought in especially for the job. And for visitors, when they came to the village or went away again, they could stop here, have a drink of water from the water jars that were placed inside this great well. You know, it's amazing how many points of similarity there are between the Dera Medina of 3,000 years ago and Egyptian villages of today. The life wasn't all beer and skittles here. The village, after all, was state-supported. That meant it was at the mercy of the national economy. But sometimes in Egypt, that wasn't too good. Around 1100 BC, the annual flooding of the Nile started to go down, and that made real hardship in Egypt. And then in Turkey, iron was refined for the first time, and everybody wanted it. It was a sort of an international price explosion. In fact, sometimes in Egypt, life got so hard, that the temples who sent the food up here couldn't actually get their act together, and the workers had to go down to the temples to complain about it. It was the sort of really the first strikes in history. I made some notes about them, actually. They're quite interesting. Sort of a hieroglyphic newspaper, really. Translation of. Well, it starts off by describing the walk off the job. It says, today the gang of workmen left the royal tomb, which, of course, is where they're working the royal valley. They said, we are hungry. Eighteen days of the month have gone by without rations. They went off to the temple and had a sit-down, so it's the first sit-down in history as well. Anyway, after that, a sort of representative of management appeared, you see, and he said, return, we have a message from the king. They'd heard that one before, so they decided not to go back to work, and more negotiations took place. They brought the priest along. They turned on the priest and they said to him, we have been driven here by hunger and thirst. We have no clothes, no fat, no fish, no vegetables. Tell this to the king and his ministers so that we may receive the means to live. Well, they must have done it because probably the vizier gave them some rations to tie them over until the king got here and organized the thing properly. But the most important thing about this strike is not that it's the first strike in history. There may have been others we don't know about. The most important thing is that there's a sort of moral outrage to it, a sort of tone of morality that comes in. And soon you find they're having strikes that aren't about hunger. In fact, one text deliberately says, it was not hunger which made us leave the tomb, walk off the job, but we have serious complaints to make. Truly scandalous things have happened. And that, if you like, is the birth of political morality. This strange shattered landscape is a sort of ancient Egyptian industrial wasteland. It's the granite quarries at Aswan. For thousands of years, the Egyptians worked here, cutting out blocks of stone and shipping them down the Nile to make the temples and the tombs and the sarcophagi, all the monuments for eternity that the ancient Egyptians needed. They worked with copper chisels, but not much, because the copper they had is very soft, and they had to continually resharpen them. And this was a sort of basic implement. It's a slightly harder granite. And with it, they just pounded the rock, like that. And you can see, when I hit it, 
it makes this awful dust. Very bad for the hands, awful for the complexion. But if you bang away like this for six months, get a few hundred guys to help you, you can make yourself an obelisk. Of all the monuments ever made of Aswan granite, this is probably the most extraordinary. It's never even left the quarries. Dozens of men bash this trench out in an attempt to free this block. Had they done so, they'd have cut the largest freestanding block in the world, 1,100 tons or 140 feet of it. They were making an obelisk, probably for one of the great temples of Thebes. But when they started to cut the sides out, like a great whale, it started to sort of open up. So it was left here. Really, it's quite good that it was, because with all the marks of man on it, it's the most remarkable monument to the dedication and also to the confidence of the ancient people. It's this confidence, this extraordinarily assured aesthetic command that stamps Egyptian public art. No one today can make such effortlessly beautiful figurative sculpture on such an enormous scale. This work is truly of a great civilization, the product, seemingly, of giants. Great, is it? Sort of like every schoolboy's vision of ancient Egypt, something that fell off the set of Ben Hur. And that's hardly surprising, really, because the set designers of Ben Hur used designs from temples like this for their ideas. The Ptolemies were Macedonian Greeks descended from a general of Alexander the Great. They ruled Egypt for about 300 years. The last one was the famous Cleopatra. They ruled Egypt actually pretty firmly, pretty well. It was prosperous, but it was a hard life for the Egyptians. They were often rebelling. The Ptolemies sent big armies in that really smashed the place up and destroyed a lot of temples, actually grinding them into dust. They also built temples, hundreds and hundreds, almost thousands of temples all over Egypt, all beautifully made out of very fine blocks of stone. And it's sort of ironic that the temples that they made actually guarded the old Egyptian religion and the old way of doing things. Staff saw that the temples were like complete records of the ancient Egyptian religion of the area. So that if all that was left in ancient Egypt today were the Ptolemaic temples, you'd be able to construct a mythical history of all of the country, how it worked, how it's functioned, how it had been created, how the gods fitted in, the whole thing.
Ptolemies really did a number on column tops. They took over what was really one of the oldest designs in Egyptian art and filled it up with new vegetable life. They actually created a new art form. And this is true too of the reliefs in the temples. It's much more elaborate, more involved and more three-dimensional than any Egyptian art we've seen before. You see, I think this is one of the really knockout things about Ptolemaic art, how they managed to get all the ancient forms and put new life back into them. And you look at this guy here, for instance, he's wearing this crown. People have been wearing this for 3,000 years in Egyptian art. These ram's horns have been given just a new twist, just a new look, just a new view, and the man's face. It's Egyptian, you can tell it's Egyptian, but it's got new shapes, new forms running all over it. It's the same with the whole wall. And I think it owes more, actually, to Greek sculpture than people have realised. But I think it's a joy of life and almost a quality of sensuality that you can see in these works, which are perhaps a new sign of Egyptian art. This lady here, for instance, has never been anything quite like her before in ancient Egypt. She's really stunning, isn't she? I mean, if you shut your eyes here, you see, and just run up your hand, like just like that, you know? And you can really, really get the feeling there's something quite new going on here. The ancient Egyptians before were rather shy of people. These enormous Ptolemaic temples may have been the centre of national culture, but they were financed by foreign pharaohs, Macedonians, and they joined Egypt onto the Mediterranean world for the first time. And so it was inevitable that Egypt passed under the control of Rome. First, as a private estate of the Emperor Augustus, who ordered the killing of the last Ptolemy, and then under the most holy Christian Emperor of Constantinople. When suddenly at the midnight hour an invisible troop is heard passing with exquisite music, with shouts, do not mourn in vain your fortune failing you now, your works that have failed, the plans of your life that have all turned out to be illusions. Christianity arrived in Egypt with St. Mark shortly after the death of Christ. It was wickedly persecuted until it became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century. And that was about the same time as the last hieroglyphic inscriptions were carved. Yet there were some points of similarity between the old religion of Egypt and the new religion of Christ. Hathor, for example, and the goddess Isis were identified for a while with the Virgin Mary. But basically, the attitude of the new religion to the old was one of fear and hostility. Damaged walls and columns in the temples tell us a very interesting story about the way the Christians thought about the ancient images. See, when they attacked them, they didn't go to obliterate the scenes, but merely to kill the people in them. They were still very frightened of the power of the ancient gods. And that's very true in a famous story you can hear about a, the Serapeum in Alexandria. There, a Christian mob rushed into the ancient temple to smash up the statue of the god. When they burst through the last part of the building, they stood before the god, they suddenly all sort of brought themselves to a halt and they were actually in terror of the ancient image. You see, there was a legend that anybody who touched it dropped dead. So they sort of stood there and scratched themselves a bit and didn't quite know what to do. Until one guy, who was a bit braver than the rest, rushed forward with an axe and struck the figure of the god right across the neck. And at that moment, the entire gang of Christians descended on the statue and tore it to pieces in a great fury. The journey's over, all 6,000 years of it, 300 generations of people. I'm back home, here in my valley, Valley of the Kings. My house is just down there. 
I'll be working in the royal tombs, photographing, measuring, conserving them. Perhaps I might even find some more. Perhaps even old Harry Hall. It's not just finding things that's difficult. They're all over the place, everywhere in Egypt. It's finding things that give you knowledge that's important. It's like me looking for old Harry Hall, and I really think he's out here somewhere, and a few other kings as well. What they give us, or will give us when I got them, is a complete picture, a whole sequence of royal tombs, and that'll give us all sorts of information about how the ancient architects felt and thought. There's something even more important than finding things, and that should be a great worry to archaeologists, and that is what the hell happens to it when it's dug up. People come and they see a plaster wall, and they think, ah, plaster wall. They don't realise that just one tap, poof, it's gone. Some of it you can just wipe off with your finger. Some of the walls are like, are like gossamer. We've really got to look after them and keep them. They're more important than scholars, these monuments, much, much more important than the people who come and study them, because they are the past, that's all we have. We need the monuments more than we need the scholars. The scholars can only give us interpretations of the monuments. But if you've got the monuments, you've got the milestones. 